maitas. your singing. That was beautiful. So this is Balaam part two. And actually that looks great. Uh, someday I should think about using PowerPoint, but it's actually all I can do to write it. So if I had to find pictures to go with it as well, I, I don't know how that would go for me. <laughs> so uh, when I began reading about Balaam, uh, I realized very quickly that there was a lot of information about him that I had never been aware of. And the more that I study Balaam, the more I realize how relevant his story is uh, to our lives today. And so I said that I would do a three-part series on him, but I might have lied about that because I, I, it might need four. <laughs> but we'll see. Um, I haven't completed him. I just write it as I go, and it, it seems to be getting bigger. Um, so our readings today will just cover the end of Numbers 22 from verse 36 on and, and Numbers 23. So if you want to turn to that in your Bible, you can go along with us. Um, we'll, just, we'll just bow our heads in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for your word, and we know that everything in the Bible is is meant for us, for, for our information, but for changing our lives, Lord, that everything that you have included in this holy book is important for us today. And Lord, we just ask that you would open our hearts and open our minds to receive your word, Lord, that we would be 
be doers of your word and not just hearers only. And we just ask a special blessing on this congregation today as we study together. In your name we pray. Amen. So, as usual, uh, I'm, I'm not a preacher, and I'm, I'm really just sharing material from a, a number of sources with you. And so today, uh, everything we're going over comes from, from the Bible. Uh, it comes from the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary uh, from Matthew Henry. And just in the last week, I came on an author called uh, Nancy Lee DeMoss, and she has uh, a wonderful series uh, on blessings and curses. And I'm going to share a little bit from, uh, from her series with you because it just seems to go along so well with what we're studying. And so for anyone who wasn't here for part one, um, I'll just review quickly. Uh, everything in part one is probably everything you already know about Balaam. Um, he's a prophet, but he's not a good prophet. Uh, he's a prophet from the area where Abraham originally came from. Uh, and he may have been good once, but now he has, um, he has changed. He has become uh, a lover of, of money. And uh, he, he sells his skills to the highest bidder. And so Israel, uh, the children of Israel, are now coming finally after their 40 years. They've come. Uh, they're approaching the land of Canaan. They've, they've had a couple of successful battles. And uh, the Midianites and the Moabites are, are quite afraid that they are in peril. So uh, the king, King Balak, has, has summoned Balaam from a long distance away, about 400 miles, uh, to come and curse God's people. Uh, he knows that he cannot meet them in battle. They've had so much success against strong enemies. He thinks the only weapon he has against them would be a spiritual weapon. And because Balak is known that what he, whatever he blesses is blessed, and whatever he curses is cursed, uh, they, have, they have summoned him to come and help them. And so against the instruction of the Lord, uh, Balak has come. He's quite covetous for honor. He wants to get honor and wealth. And so uh, nothing has stopped him from coming. Not even his donkey talking to him or the sight of the angel of the Lord in his path with a sword. Uh, none of those things have dissuaded him from his rash course. And so um, I didn't quite finish Numbers 22 last time. So starting in 36, um, now when, Balaam heard, when Balak heard that Balaam was coming, he went out to meet him at the city of Moab, which is on the border at the Arnon, the boundary of the territory. And Balak said to Balaam, did I not earnestly send to you, calling for you? Why did you not come to me? Am I not able to honor you? And Balaam said to Balak, look, I have come to you. Now have I any power at all? To say anything? The word that God puts in my mouth, that I must speak. And so Balaam went with Balak, and they came to Kirjath Huzoth, and Balak offered oxen and sheep, and he sent some to Balaam and the princes who were with him. So here we have the first meeting between Balaam and Balak. And, and Balak is a king, but he is so eager to meet with this prophet that he doesn't wait for for Balaam to come to him, he goes to the very boundary of his territory. He has such high hopes for Balaam's spiritual powers that he humbles himself. Uh, he doesn't act very king-like. He doesn't wait to be have the prophet brought to him. He, he goes. Um, he rushes out. He has so much eagerness to have this mischief done to the Israelites. And he chides Balaam for not coming the first time he called. He had to send two uh, groups to come and get him. He says, why didn't you come sooner? I begged you to come. And I am able to promote you to great honor. It is so tempting to succumb to worldly honors and worldly enticements. And Balaam has come, but he's, he still remembers uh, the memory of that angel the angel of the Lord uh, standing with a sword and opposing him in his pathway is very fresh. And so 
he wants to settle Balak down a little bit. Uh, he says, yes, I have come, but I do not have any power to choose my own words. I can only speak the word that God puts in my mouth. And so Balak entertains him overnight. And so they offer a sacrifice, but this is not a sacrifice to the Lord. Uh, this is a sacrifice to their pagan gods. They have a feast. And we know that Balaam is not a godly prophet because they send him food that has been offered to these idols and he eats of that food and the company that's with him eats this food that that is really it's it would be forbidden for a man of God to eat food sacrificed to idols and so the next day Balak took Balaam and brought him up to the high places of Baal that from there he might observe the extent of the people. And so a high place, uh, it, it means two things. Obviously, it's, it's a high place. It's a place that has a good view. It has a good vantage point. But a high place is also a place where they sacrifice to pagan idols. And so Balaam instructs Balak. You know, these words, they're very close. So Balak ends with a K for king. <laughs> So that's how I don't mix up Balaam and Balak. You can, you can do whatever you want. Maybe you'll just remember. Um, so Balaam instructs he needs seven altars. He needs seven oxen and seven rams. So they are thinking to really please God with all these altars and all these sacrifices. They are going to bribe him with this wealth of sacrifice. Uh, and, and they are offering these to God, to Jehovah, and no other deity. And the offerings are clean meat. These would be acceptable sacrifices to God. But the multiplying of altars was a sign of their degeneracy and their apostasy to idolatry. Because those who multiply altars multiply gods. Balaam went to be alone. He went to a private place, uh, perhaps some grove, uh, where he would be alone. And he says, in case God would meet with him. Per adventure, the Lord will come to meet with me, he says. He's aware of his guilt. He, he's there against the good advice of God. Uh, and he cannot be confident that God will come to meet him at all. Now, God does come to meet with him. But he has not been summoned by this abomination of the seven altars. Uh, or Balaam's false piety. Balaam has all these sacrifices there, but they cost him nothing. Uh, it, it was no sacrifice for, for him to provide this. The, Balak is the king. He's providing all these things there. Uh, they're not costing Balaam anything. He didn't do the work of building the altars, and he didn't provide the sacrifice. But God comes. It is God's pleasure at this time to put a word in Balaam's mouth. And so Balaam returned to the sacrifice, and he took up his oracle, his message, and he said, Balak, the king of Moab, has brought me from Aram, from the mountains of the east. Come, curse Jacob for me, and come, denounce Israel. How shall I curse whom God has not cursed? And how shall I denounce whom the Lord has not denounced? From the top of the rocks I see him. And from the hills I behold him. There, a people dwelling alone, not reckoning itself among the nations. Who can count the dust of Jacob, or number one-fourth of Israel? Let me die the death of the righteous, and let my end be like his. So Balaam admits his weakness and the impotence of his divinations. He can never curse what God has blessed. And God had warned Israel not to use divinations. And here we see the futility of trying. From his vantage point, he can see that Israel is peculiar and distinct among the nations. He may have been told to expect an unruly mob, but their camp is laid out in perfection. They are different in diet and dress, in religion and sacred rites. And God's people today should be the same. We are meant to be in the world, but not of it. It is still our duty and our honor to stand out from the crowd. God had blessed them in numbers, 
and Balaam admired them. He paid homage to the promise in Genesis that they should be as dust for number. And Israel was divided into four squadrons and they had four standards. Even one part, even one fourth of Israel is too numerous for him to count. And he speaks with desire that he might die the death of the righteous. Now Balaam was not willing to live the life of the righteous, but he desired the posterity of a righteous death. He somehow would like to be a saint in heaven without the bother of being obedient to God while on earth. It is appointed to man to die. Everyone dies, the righteous and the wicked alike. But the death of the righteous is preferable. It is more desirable than the death of the unrighteous and maybe even more desirable than continuing to live an unrighteous life. It is almost that Balaam is saying, I could be willing to die right now, provided my death at this moment would be righteous, that it might be like his. Like whose? Well, like, like Israel's. But we don't know, did Balaam have a presentiment from God regarding the death of Moses? For Balaam, this desire for a righteous death is just a vain wish. This is not a prayer, because he's not willing to do anything to back up this desire. You know, if Balaam had wanted to, he could have immediately accepted this light that God had given him. He could have severed his ties with Moab and returned home in repentance. It could have been done. But he still yearned for, quite literally, the wages of sin. He's, he still wants to hang around because he wants the money. He, he can see the glory of the righteous life, but it's somehow dimmer to him than the wealth that he could have today. He would rather enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. And so Balak says to Balaam, what have you done to me? I, t I took you to curse my enemies, and look, you have blessed them bountifully. So Balak pretended to honor God with his sacrifices, and God has come. He put out seven sacrifices so that God would come, and now God has answered him with words that he does not want to hear. And so he forgets about God, and he flies into a great passion against Balaam, as if somehow this is Balaam's fault. And I wonder how often we ourselves profess to seek God's will for us. And then we are unhappy if we get an answer that doesn't jive with what our heart's desires are. How often do we ask for, we ask for God to give us a sign, but really what we want is an excuse to continue indulging in our own will. And Balaam answers with prophetic gravity. He says, must I not take heed to speak what the Lord has put in my mouth? Balak has an opportunity here to rethink his way. As the king, he could withdraw from this fool's errand. He's, he's related to the people of Israel. They, they have a bond. He could have changed his approach to them. But instead, he remains committed to his original design. And this is an example of how resolute are the enemies of the church in their attempts to ruin it. If only we were as steadfast in carrying out good designs for God's glory as the enemies of God are in carrying out evil designs for the church's destruction. So Balak decides they need to regroup. The problem is they're in the wrong place. They need to go to an alternate site. Balaam, he probably had too excellent a view of God's people. They, they were so attractive in organization and so numerous that he was just overcome. He was too impressed to curse them. Uh, he was afraid to curse them. So instead, they, they go to a different place, the field of Zophim. And the word Zophim means to spy upon or to keep watch upon. Um, the name Zophim actually means the field of the watchers. And so we don't know the exact site of this field, but it was likely another high place. Uh, and it was on Pisgah, which is the high mountain from which the Lord would show Moses all the land. 
And so from this field on Pisgah, we imagine that the view is, is perhaps less expansive or at least situated in such a way that Balaam's view of the camp is diminished. Maybe if he can just see part of the camp, he could curse that small part and they could kind of get a toehold into overcoming Israel. So seven new altars are built and the sacrifices are repeated. And again, Balaam withdraws from the group and God meets with him a second time to put a word in his mouth. If God will deign to meet with a false prophet who is seeking to overthrow his chosen people, he will not refuse to listen to us when we seek him. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. The next prophecy will not reverse the former, but it will rather ratify it. And so Balaam took up his oracle and said, Rise up, Balak, and hear. Listen to me, son of Zippor. So it's like, pay attention. Pay attention, Balak. Listen with reverence and ponder well the meaning of what the Lord is saying to you. God is not a man that he should lie, nor son of a man that he should repent. Has he said, and will he not do? Or has he spoken, and will he not make good? Behold, I have received a command to bless he has blessed, and I cannot reverse it. He has not observed iniquity in Jacob, nor has he seen wickedness in Israel. The Lord his God is with him, and a shout of a king is among them. God brings them out of Egypt. He has strength like a wild ox, for there is no sorcery against Jacob, nor any divination against Israel. It now must be said of Jacob, and of Israel, oh, what God has done. Look, a people rises like a lioness and lifts itself up like a lion. It shall not lie down until it devours the prey and drinks the blood of the slain. So this is a strong prophecy. Uh, God is unchangeable. Men change their minds and break their words. They can be bribed and their opinion can be altered. God never changes his mind and never recalls his promises. It's a, a bit of a shot at them. It's like, you did this already. You've already had this sacrifice, and now you're doing it again, expecting a different answer from the same guy. When in Scripture it is written that God repents, it is never a change of God's mind, but only a change of his way or his method. There is no shadow of turning with thee. His decrees are unalterable. His promises are never broken. They cannot be. He has blessed, and I cannot reverse it. And what I think is so beautiful here, it says, God has not beheld iniquity in Jacob. And this is a beautiful statement. Now, we know it is not possible that Israel is perfect. But God sees them through the lens of Christ's blood the sacrifice to come that will cleanse from all unrighteousness. Though our sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. There is no perverseness in Israel at this time. There is no idolatry. There is nothing to separate them from God. Now, in many cases, they were very provoking. But since the incident of the golden calf 40 years prior, they had remained faithful to God, and he would not permit them to be injured. And so, when I was reading Blesses and Curses, this theme was compared to a verse from Solomon. In Solomon 4.7 we read, You are altogether beautiful, my love. In you there is no flaw. This is a bridegroom saying to his bride, There is no flaw in you. Now, in our human experience, there is no woman that would inspect herself and say, there is no flaw in me. But the lover, the bridegroom says, I see you through the eyes of love. You are beautiful and you are perfect in my eyes. You know what, my husband thinks I am beautiful. He tells me I'm beautiful and you know, this is good for me. 
And it doesn't have to be true. It's true for him. <laughs> and no one should disabuse him of this notion. <laughs> And this is the heart of it, that God loves us when we are still sinners. He sent his son to die for us. And so when we are in Christ, we put on his robe of righteousness, and God sees no sin in us. All of our past mistakes and the times we fell, all of the times that we embraced sin, that we, we wanted to sin, God doesn't see those times anymore. God does not behold iniquity in you. <sighs> I'm getting very emotional. <laughs> they had the joy of God's presence. The shout of a king is among them. God's presence had been seen and felt since their miraculous rescue from Egypt all those years before. He delivered them from bondage by his power and his might. It was nothing they could do for themselves. He showed himself in a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. No witchcraft planned against these people could prosper. The curses of hell can never defeat the blessings of heaven. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand. God is protecting them with the strength of a wild ox. In Romans 8, we read, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now Israel... They're just resting. They're in that camp, they're resting. But they're preparing themselves to rise as a great lion that will not lie down until they have eaten the meat and drank the blood of their prey. They would obtain a conquest of the land of the Canaanites. In the soon coming war against the Midianites, in chapter 31, verse 49, we read that not one Israelite would lose their life. That's not a battle. That's predator and prey. Balak had hoped to ruin Israel, but what hope, what hope could he have of that when Israel was under the care of the one true God? Now Balak hears this and he says to Balaam, neither curse them at all nor bless them at all. Well, he is angry, he doesn't like what he's heard, and sometimes the truth hurts. We would rather not hear it. We would rather be deaf. But we should never close our ears to God's truth. Balak was so earnest to obtain the services of Balaam, and now he just wants him to be silent. Because Balaam is not saying what Balak wants to hear. He wants him to stop speaking altogether. If you can't say anything horrible, don't say anything at all. If you can't curse Israel, at least stop blessing them. If you cannot assist and encourage my forces, at least do not oppose and dispirit them. And Balaam again reminds Balak, All the Lord speaketh, that I must do. But Balaam would still like to be of service to Balak. He still wants the money, even after all that he's seen and experienced of God. His sights are on earthly glory and recognition. He is constrained by God in his speech. But how much better it would have been for Balaam to fully submit his heart to God. I mean, he was a pagan prophet, and look what he prophesied, what he could have accomplished if he had, if he had joined the right team. Now, at this point, Israel is unaware of this complex and arduous scheme that's being contrived against them. And so far, they have in no way been badly affected by the hostility of the Moabites. They know they're not welcome. They had been forced to detour because of the Moabites. But they really don't know that Balak is plotting their, their destruction and their ruin. Their walk with God has thus far insulated them from any suffering or any real or lasting harm from the machinations of Balak. But this is what we need to remember. 
Uh, and maybe this is one of the key messages of the whole Balaam story, is that God is sovereign over curses that are hurled at his people. God is sovereign over the curses that may be hurled at you right now, curses that you're aware of or unaware of that are sent in your direction. And before we finish for today, I actually want to share an excerpt from Blessings and Curses. Um, we see in our day that if you profess the name of Christ, if you love truth, if you believe in absolutes, and if you hold to the authority of scripture, if you believe in holiness and the sanctity of human life, if you believe in a biblical definition of marriage, if you want to proclaim the gospel, if you want to preach the exclusivity of Christ as the only way to the Father, you will be maligned. You will be misunderstood. You will be falsely accused. And you will meet with resistance. Now, people don't come out and say, I curse you. It doesn't come out that explicitly. Sometimes it's just a pushback that making you feel like you're the one who's crazy. You're the one who's foolish. You're the one who needs to get a life. You're the one who needs to bear the brunt of legal restrictions. And so, as a Christian, you can begin to feel really intimidated and overwhelmed by all that darkness. But we need to remember that God is sovereign over these things. And I, I want to point your attention to a passage in 2 Samuel chapter 16. Uh, it's, it's a different account from the life of David, but it goes so well with this story of Balaam. And it talks about this crossfire between blessing and cursing and different ways that we can respond to being cursed. And so in 2 Samuel 16, we come to a place where King David's son has tried to overthrow him. Absalom has staged a coup, and David has had to flee from the capital city. And Absalom is after him, and he's following him, and, and David is still the king, but he has been run out of town. He's been chased out of the city of the great king. Uh, he's left Dodge, and he's come to a place called Behurim. And there he meets a man from the family of the house of Saul. This man is a descendant of Saul, and his name is Shim Shimei. <laughs> Somebody said it. This is very obscure, so I'm really pleased. <laughs> and so his name is Shimei, the son of Gera, and as he came, he cursed continually. And he threw stones at David and at all the servants of King David, and all the people and all the mighty men are on his right hand and on his left. And Shimei said as he cursed, Get out, get out, you man of blood, you worthless man. Sometimes people say mean things to us today when we're children of God. The, the Lord has avenged on you all the blood of the house of Saul, in whose place you have reigned, and the Lord has given the kingdom into the hand of your son Absalom. See, your evil is on you, for you are a man of blood. So this is Shimei. He was a supporter of King Saul, who lost his kingdom, and it was given over to David. But He's coming back, Shimei is coming back to say to David, you don't deserve this kingdom. You took it from Saul, and now your son is taking it from you. And he's cursing, and he's throwing stones, and, and his curses are untrue, right? I mean, David is on the run, he's on the defensive. And Shimei is speaking all these evil things of him, and David does not deserve this treatment. David is God's anointed king. He did not take the kingdom from Saul. God took the kingdom from Saul. It was in David's hand to remove, to take Saul's life from him on at least two occasions, and he held himself back. He said, I will not touch the Lord's anointed. And David is God's anointed king. He is a man after God's own heart. And now we see that there's two very different responses to this treatment that he's receiving at the hands of Shimei. And so, We'll see the first response because Abishai, who I think is a nephew of King David's, he's the, the son of Zer Zeruiah, he says to the king, 
Why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Let me go over and take off his head. That's one response to cursing. I'm just going to rip your head off. And sometimes that feels good. If people curse us, who, who doesn't want to get a little bit back? I mean, we use this term, I'm going to just rip his head off. We, we can use harsh words back. I mean, in this case, really, uh, he would have ripped his head off. And it would have been easy. I, uh, all of his mighty men are there. It's, it's no problem for them. They're trained in battle. But that's not King David's response. The king said, What have I to do with you, sons of Zeruiah? If he is cursing because the Lord has said to him, Curse David, who then shall say, Why have you done so? So I can't go into all the layers of this. There's a mystery of this. There's a mystery here. But one thing I see in David's response that's clear is that he has a view that God has sovereign control over everything that happens. And God has sovereign control over this man's cursing. He's allowing him to do it. And if God is allowing it, David is not going to stop it. He's just going to accept it. He's going to bear this cursing. Now, does God ordain sin? I'm not going to try and explain that all here, but at some level, Shimei cursing David is under God's sovereign control, and David recognizes it, and he's going to bear it. And David says to Abishai and to all his servants, Behold, my own son seeks my life. How much more now may this Benjamite, right? My own son that came from my loins is trying to kill me and take my kingdom. You know what? If this man wants to curse me, let him do it. Leave him alone and let him curse, for the Lord has told him to. Again, this is something big to wrap our heads around, but David sees that somehow in the context of God's sovereignty, that this burden that he has to bear is, has been given to him. He's going to bear this burden. He's going to take this abuse. It may be that the Lord will look on the wrong done to me and that the Lord will repay me with good for his cursing today. He's saying, regardless of what happens, I'm not going to take matters into my own hands. I'm going to let God be God. And he insists on trusting the Lord and not taking vengeance and waiting on God to vindicate his servant. And so David and his men went down the road while Shimei went along on the hillside opposite him. So just picture this, they're, they're on the run, they're on this road and Shimei is walking along above them on this hillside and it runs along the road and he's cursing as he goes and he's throwing stones at them and he's flinging dust at them and this would be a really uncomfortable thing to go through. It would be a hard place to be. It would be hard not to retaliate. And David the king and all the people who were with him arrived weary at the Jordan. Don't you just find sometimes that the opposition to the people of God just wears you out? And this can be happening in your own home. It may be a prodigal son or daughter that despises the things of God and is rejecting you. It could be your own husband who has rejected God's truth and is uncomfortable with how your life brings the presence of Christ into your marriage and into your home. These people may walk along your side and throw dust and throw stones at you and curse you as you go and it's exhausting and David arrived weary at the Jordan but then we get to verse 14 and it says and there he refreshed himself so sooner or later in his way and in his time God will get you to a place of refreshment he will take you to a place where you can be refreshed and replenish and your weariness can be strengthened. You don't have to fight back in your own strength. You don't have to use your own weapons or your own instruments. You can trust God to do that for you and he will refresh you. So, we'll have to go back to numbers next time because I kind of run out of room. But. I'll leave you with that and 
If you get a chance to read about Balaam, there's just so much for us in his life. It's so many years ago and seems so foreign, but everything you read about Balaam has a message for us today.